Hey guys, Mr. Hyatt here. This is the chapter three lecture. As you see on the screen, we're talking about ecosystems. What are they and how do they work? So finally, we're out of the review stuff and we're into uh, some, some, hopefully some new stuff. Uh, the Earth's life support system has four major components. So uh, let's think about our, our word skills here. So atmosphere, that's going to be the air. Uh, so two key stripes within the atmosphere are the troposphere and the stratosphere. Uh, the troposphere is where all weather happens and the stratosphere is where the ozone layer happens. So talk a little bit more about those as we go. The hydrosphere is going to be everything that's water. The geosphere is going to be everything that's earth. And the biosphere is going to be everything that's alive. So those are the four major components of the earth. If you look at this cross section of the earth, we can see where these things reside. There's the biosphere, soil and rock. That's going to be the geosphere all the way down to the core. The atmosphere and the biosphere are going to have some overlap, and the hydrosphere and the biosphere are going to have some overlap. There are three huge things that sustain life here on Earth. Number one, we've got a one-way flow of energy. The sun is always giving us energy that's given, that plants are harnessing, that living things eat, that also get released to the environment as heat and radiation to space. We'll talk a lot more about that as we go. Nu nutrients get cycled through parts of the biosphere, through the food web, and then gravity holds Earth's atmosphere. That third point, we won't talk a lot about that. A little bit, but not a lot. The first two, we'll talk a ton about. So, guys, remember, next week, Monday, Tuesday, we present, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, our final exam. So we present in the last actual class period before finals. So, what are we doing for the next Oh, yeah. We present on Tuesday, not Reviewing. I know you were classes. Oh, okay. I In other classes, is that like final exam review for like yeah, that yeah. class? Oh. Yeah. I thought you were supposed to use that like to study for your other finals. That's what I do. It's study hall. <laughs> Okay, so a couple of important things uh, from the sun, or I guess based upon the sun. Uh, the sun produces three types of energy, ultraviolet light, visible light, and then infra infrared. Um, so the term radiation is, uh, it, it describes a lot. And it, it's been sort of uh, generalized to mean a couple of things that it doesn't technically mean to a scientist. So anyway, uh, radiation could be any of these three. Uh, absorbed by the ozone and other atmospheric gases. That's great because radiation can break our DNA and give us things like skin cancer. Uh, radiation is absorbed by the earth, mostly in land places, reflected by the earth, mostly in water, but some land-based uh, ecosystems can reflect radiation. And certainly buildings and glass and things along those lines can reflect radiation. Uh, and then radi radiation is radiated by the atmosphere as heat. That sounds a little redundant, but... Uh, uh, we, we release radiation as heat. Um, so there is a natural greenhouse effect, which is uh, a really good thing because it keeps heat close to the earth and gives us the, uh, the temperature to support life on earth. Here's a picture that shows the flow to and from in, uh, of energy to and from the earth. We've got our solar radiation comes to the earth. Some of it gets bounced back. Most is absorbed by the UV, I'm sorry, by the ozone layer. Some of it's absorbed by the earth, but some of it's kicked back out and then gets, gets released over here uh, as heat. Some gets 
start, starts to get kicked out but then gets bounced back down to the surface. That's what we call the greenhouse effect. So ecology uh, is something that you spent a decent amount of time in biology one studying. Um, these terms should sound familiar as the way that we organize and group life uh, from the organismal level up to all life on earth. But before we get to that, uh, ecology, uh, the definition I give my freshmen is ecology is all about interactions. Uh, interact, interactions between living things in one species, interactions between one species and another, interactions between species and their environment. So the non-living and, and living interactions as well. Um, so then the rest of those terms, uh, organisms are going to be living things, same species, same place, same time, gives us a population. We look at all populations in one place at the same time. Now we've got a community. If we throw abiotics in there, we've got an ecosystem. And then we group all of our ecosystems together uh, into biomes, and the biomes come together to form the biosphere. Graphical representation of uh kind of a uh, generalization. We, we talked through part of this, or if not all of this, in, in chapter one, um, but that shows our grouping all the way from the atomic level up through uh, the biosphere. So again, like I said, an ecosystem, which is what this chapter is focused upon, uh, an ecosystem is all the populations in an area. That's our biotic factors here. Uh, and notice that biotic includes once living. So dead things were once living, so they, they get counted as biotic factors. Um, so an ecosystem is all the population, so all the living things, and the non-living things. So there's a list on your screen of some of the non-living things. Uh, these are things that have never ever been alive, but still absolutely influence the living things there and absolutely impact uh, the other non-living things in the ecosystem. Kind of a picture uh, that shows um, some of these things and how they interact through the food web and through a couple of the energy cycles. Um, but yeah, remember when we're talking about an ecosystem, and when we say the word ecosystem, what should pop in your head is all living things and all non-living things in an area at the same place at the same time. Okay, diving a little bit more deeply here, uh, we're, we're getting into the food web here and some, some specifics uh, in terms of vocab. Uh, producers are, are going to be called autotrophs because... Uh, they make their energy themselves, so self-energy. Um, they don't make food, they make energy. There's a key distinction there. Food has to be consumed, energy does not. Um, many producers use photosynthesis with the chemical equation that you see there. That's one that you'll want to commit to memory if you haven't done so already. But some producers use a process called chemosynthesis where they take inputs of chemicals and chemical energy instead of sunlight and they can produce glucose and oxygen. Uh, those are often called extremophiles. They're, they're definitely uh, fewer organisms, fewer, there's, there is less diversity amongst chemosynthesizers than there is photosynthesizers. And then, of course, we all know that consumers are heterotrophs because they're other energy. They have to get their energy from somewhere else. Uh, and we've got some special terms for those. Uh, primary consumers are going to eat plants. Secondaries eat primaries. Tertiaries eat secondaries. Quaternaries eat tertiaries. Of course, carnivore, omnivore, herbivore, pescivore, all those things get rolled in there as well. Of course, we got to have some pictures. We know what producers look like. Uh, we know what consumers look like. Um, so then we move on to decomposers and detrivores, which are very, very similar. Uh, detrivores are an offshoot of decomposers. Uh, but the difference is, uh, for lack of a better way of explaining it, detrivores are more, more selfish. Certainly decomposers are selfish. They're releasing nutrients. They're breaking down uh, dead matter. Uh, but they release a huge amount of energy. I'm sorry, they release a huge amount of nutrients back into the soil or back into the water, wherever it is they might happen to leave. Uh, detrivores don't necessarily release those nutrients. Uh, I think vultures are a better visual example because we know, we know what those are. Um, they're certainly going to feed on the dead bodies of other organisms, but a lower percentage of what they consume gets cycled back into the ecosystem. And there are pictures of decomposers and detrivores. Another picture of detrivores. <clears throat> so two key types of energy processing 
that consumers and, and producers are going to use uh, are aerobic respiration. Anytime you hear aerobic, whether that's exercise, respiration, anytime you hear the word aerobic, that means you're using oxygen. And in terms of respiration, we're going to use oxygen to turn glucose to carbon dioxide and water. That's going to release energy. That's how we're going to power our systems. Anaerobic respiration uh, is often called fermentation, and that's where we're going to break down uh, our glucose, and we're going to end with products like methane and acetic acid. And anybody who's ever run long distances has felt the burn. They felt the effect of buildup of acid uh, through fermentation. The next portion of this chapter all deals with energy flow and nutrient cycling. So how things, uh, specifically energy and, and a couple of different nutrients, are going to move around uh, through the biosphere into the geosphere and sometimes in the atmosphere. So here's kind of a picture that shows the basic idea. We've always got an input of solar energy and we've always got an output of heat. So we're losing and gaining energy constantly, but matter is constantly being cycled. So one of our case studies uh, in this chapter is, is about uh, many of the world's most important species being invisible to us. So bacteria, protists, and fungi all go through photosynthesis. They all produce oxygen that we consume. They do a lot of things for us. They perform a lot of ecosystem services and have a lot of natural capital, but we can't see them. So it's often difficult for a lot of non-science people to realize the impact that these different organisms have on us. You guys are science people, and I bet you would have a hard time describing what protists do, or even picking a protist out of a lineup. So um, make sure you've read that case study. Uh, some really good details in there. Just wanted to take a few minutes to point that out and talk through the basics. Okay, so a food chain, a food web, it's going to show how energy and nutrients move through the biosphere. Um, so a chain is what it sounds like, link, 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 link. Um, Process is, in general, photosynthesis to feeding, so consumerism, and then decomposition at the end. Uh, notice that this term trophic level is in here. That's going to be an energy level or a step in the food chain. And then the web is going to be what it sounds like. It's going to be webby, and it's going to be messy, and it's going to be a network of interconnected food chains. So here's our chain. Notice, chain, link, 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 link. We're showing the loss of energy also. So at each step, we lose a lot of energy uh, to heat. Food web, oh geez, look at all the arrows pointing at the killer whale. That tells you you're looking at a food web. Anytime you see two arrows pointing at one organism, it's a food web, because that means it's not a chain anymore. A lot of times we see decomposers down here at the bottom with our producers, because we're going to see a lot of arrows pointing at decomposers. <clears throat> You'll see these ecological pyramids um, as we talk through this you'll see them in your book uh, but everything decreases as you go up the food chain the biomass decreases the amount of energy decreases and the number of organisms decrease so notice here one of the key points is that 90 percent of energy is lost with each transfer so that means that the higher your trophic level the less chemical energy is available for you so that explains why sharks have to eat all the time they're at the top of the food chain. They're getting a low percentage of the energy that the seaweed uh, is producing. So here's kind of what I'm talking about. If we're up here in this example, we've got phytoplankton up to humans. If we start with 10,000 units of energy that the producers harness, harness, excuse me, the human only gets 10 units of energy, 10 kilocalories in this example. At each level, we drop a zero, we lose 90% of the available energy. So again, that explains why apex predators, uh, such as ourselves, have to eat all the time. That's the end of Chapter 3, Lecture 1. We'll pick up with the next slide in Lecture 2.